It's officially 5.30, and I call this uh, meeting to order of the uh, Annexation Task Force, and this is our second meeting, and welcome to uh, Carnegie Town Hall. Um, I, and even though it's not on our agenda, I would like to have our task force to introduce themselves and uh, what your representation is on this uh, committee as well. And we'll start down to my right. Uh, good evening. Good evening. My name is Greg Starnes. I uh, live in South Cactus Heights. Uh, it's an area over by Washington High School. We are under, currently under a pre-annexation agreement with the city. Matt Metzger, I live on South Sycamore Avenue, um, and currently no annexation agreement in place. I'm Tina Haraldson, I live on South Louise, south of 77th Street, and I was recently annexed. And I'm Councillor Rick Kiley. <coughs> Councillor Greg Neisert of the Northwest District. Jeff Davis, I uh, live in Prairie Meadows, Wayne Township, uh, currently under discussion. Councillor Marshall Salberg with the Southwest District. And I would like to point out that uh, of the seven members that we have up here, four of the members are citizens like you who have either been annexed or, or maybe in some stage of annexation. Uh, so there's four citizen members as well as the, as the three councillors. And uh, I'm going to open up with some of the same remarks that I did two weeks ago because, well, could I just have a show of hands of people that were not here? two weeks ago. Great. Well, that's good. All right. So, well, welcome to the second meeting of the uh, Annexation Task Force. And this task force was formed to offer suggestions to the city administration and city council on how to improve the annexation process in Sioux Falls. This task force will not, and I repeat, we will not address specific properties or subdivisions in and around Sioux Falls. It has never been the intention of the task force to consider specific properties or subdivisions for annexation. Once again, our goal is to improve the process and to provide guidelines that are fair and equitable for all. Furthermore, if you have an existing pre-annexation agreement, the work this task force performs will not alter your existing agreement. I have also heard concerns about a timeline being set for the annexation of properties and subdivisions around the city. I want to ensure you that there is no timeline. Again, I repeat, there is no timeline. Not six months, not one year, not two years, not anything. Many of these annexations will be years out. Once again, we're discussing the process of annexation to improve upon it and to make it fair. This task force will consider issues such as incentives intended to mitigate the financial costs to families and property owners associated with annexation, uh, what criteria should be used to identify properties for city-initiated annexation, and how will they be prioritized. We'll consider basic infrastructure standards for existing subdivisions annexed into the city, and we have identified several topics for discussion. Uh, these topics will continue to be discussed today as well as at future meetings. Additional topics and meetings may be added uh, by the task force as it deems possible. Task force meetings will be open and transparent. As time permits, we will have public input at each meeting. We ask you hold your comments, and by the way, that includes this meeting. There will be time for public input at the end of this meeting, uh, and we ask that you hold your comments and questions until that time. There will be presentations given to the, to the committee, and the committee members will uh, ask the initial questions, and then at the end, we will open it up uh, for public uh, input. The City of Sioux Falls website, which you'll get more information uh, about here in a few moments, will include news releases, meeting packets, meeting recordings, and contact information for comments. And there is a link on the main page as well as on, in other areas of the city website. And in fact, you received a handout, and, um, and I think Albert 
you're going to be addressing this some more in the future, but this will address all the areas that uh, information is available. And uh, by the way, this will be, this meeting tonight is being broadcast live. It's, it's web streamed and it w it's recorded so it, it will actually be replayed at later times as well. So if at future meetings, if you cannot make a future meeting, you should be able to see a tape recording of this meeting or future meetings. Toward the end of this process, an open house or open houses will be scheduled in the evening to offer a less formal format in which to discuss the re recommendations of this task force. Once again, this task force will not address uh, or propose annexations of specific properties or subdivisions in and around Sioux Falls. Only the full city council has the authority to address annexations. This task force will simply bring recommendations to the full city council on how to improve the overall process of annexations. In fact, we're here tonight, and we were here two weeks ago, because one of our citizen members on the task force, Mr. Matt Metzger, his own individual property was up for annexation a number of months ago. And the city council had concerns about the process, especially about the communication uh, surrounding that process. And so the city council uh, put the annexation on hold, rejected it, and we are here today. So the city council has demonstrated that we are interested and truly interested in improving this process. Uh, it'll be up to the city council to adopt our recommendations, but once again, they are just recommendations. This is a, an advisory committee only. Uh, more open discussion and public input will take place again at that time once it does eventually move to the full city council. So in conclusion, the goal of this task force is to identify a process that not only assists the city in planning and the coordination of services, but it's important we identify a process that is agreeable, fair, and beneficial for all. And as I stated two weeks ago, no doubt we'll face challenges along the way, but rest assured we will take as much time as needed to ensure we produce an effective and fair process. Now I had a few other notes uh, placed in front of me just prior to arrival, but I think uh, that I have covered those in my opening comments. Um, and, and once again, if, if people standing to the side, if you grow weary of standing, uh, if there's still room in the outer room, and I have no idea, uh, Mr. Weidenbach, was there any room in the outer room when you came in? Uh, there's a TV out there as well, too. But anyway, we will uh, move on um, with uh, our regular uh, agenda now. And uh, Mr. Albert Schmidt uh, with City Planning and Zoning will do a demonstration of the annexation webpage. And that's one of the, uh, reminds me of one of the other things I was going to mention. One of the reasons we moved this to the Carnegie is number one, we all have microphones now, so it should be easier. Uh, for you to hear. Uh, it's going to be recorded and rebroadcast as well as, I'd, I'd, as I had mentioned. But uh, plus, we have the technology available to display uh, items on the screen in front of you. So, uh, Albert, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. All right, task force, um, public. So the annexation task force website is available through a few different ways through the City of Sioux Falls website for access. The easiest one for a lot of people is SiouxFalls.org. And then on the front page here, you can see down here on the ribbon here, Annexation Task Force, you can click that. It'll bring you down the information. You can click Information and Schedule, and that will link you directly to the site itself. In addition to that, at the top here, if you were to want to type it in, you can just type in SiouxFalls.org backslash annexation and that will also bring you to this website. And if you go, if you happen to be in the website anyways uh, deeper in the planning building services section, you can find the annexation task force on our main planning building services page under trending topics. In addition, if you come in to, and you're in planning and you're looking at annexations anyways under topics, the annexation task force is also linked here in resources under annexations. So we tried to get it out there as well. 
Um, and if you're like me and you like to Google things a lot or use your preferred search engine, if you search Sioux Falls annexation, typically the second result is probably our annexation website. So with that guiding you to the location, going over the actual site real briefly, on um, the right hand, top hand corner here, we have questions and feedback. You can click that to put your information in and put your inquiry, your question, or your comment in there, submit that to us, and then we can receive that. If you're looking to sign up for email notifications of meetings, notes, and things like that, you can submit that information here on the right-hand side underneath the questions and feedback form. The actual portion of the Annexation Task Force website here, the overview of the goals is kind of this main first section here. And then we jump down into the agenda, the schedules, and the meetings uh, with the newest one listed first and the oldest one listed last. So if you're looking for last agenda, you just come down here to April 11th, go over to agenda, and click the agenda link for the PDF. Same thing with our 26th. Below that, we have the meeting handout information. It should be in the same order as the meeting ones, so newest first, oldest last. So if you were interested, well, April 11th, what did we hand out? You can click that, drop down, and you can see all the handouts that we presented. Just like tonight's meeting, you can come down here and you can see all the um, information we're presenting as well. And then after that, the next section is the original list of topics, which is not what we're limited to for this, but in our initial discussion, these are the 10 topics that we initially started with wanting to cover for this uh, task force. And then the section after that is the task force member makeup, and then also the resource members, so the supporting staff such as myself, um, who are helping out with presentations, gathering information, things like that. And then the last part of it just uh, is news releases that pertain to the task force. So that's kind of our task force website. Okay. Could you show them once again where if they have questions and feedback where they can go? Because um, I know that there were questions about that two weeks ago. Sure. Um, again, if you're at the task force page, the top right-hand corner, there'll be a questions and feedbacks form, a little uh, link there. You can just click that text, and that'll bring you to the specific feedback area for your question to be emailed over. And then typically ta um, staff will get back to you with a response if it's a question. Uh, if it's a comment, we'll just relay that on then. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And uh, again, that's one of the benefits of hosting the meeting here at the Carnegie. Because with the technology, you will be able to go back and uh, actually watch this again if you so desire. There will be links on that page that Albert just showed you, and you can actually play the recording of this meeting over again. And it will also be linked from our City Council webpage, too. Uh, there's, if you're familiar with that in terms of searching for our, our meeting minutes and agendas, uh, there is an area down below that will take you to the same location. Uh, one other item, so, and again, this information, I, I believe this was on each seat as you came in. This will help you with finding that information on our website. The, um, and then the other item, housekeeping item that I'd like to, that I just remembered here is um, this information sheet was also out there. So complete the sign-in. Uh, if you have not, if you did not sign up before, uh, there is a, a sign-up sheet and is that being circulated throughout the room. So if you did not have the opportunity to uh, sign in and list your name, address, and also your email address, if you wish to have information sent to you, please do so. If you did sign up two weeks ago, it's not necessary to do it again. In fact, it's preferred that you don't because then we do not get double entries uh, into the system. But uh, just be sure that we keep that page, uh, that clipboard circulating around throughout the room so that everybody has a chance uh, to sign in before they leave. Okay, the next item of business is uh, meeting summary comments, um, and that uh, is from uh, the members of the task force. Do we have any comments regard regarding uh, the meeting summary? Okay, seeing none, we'll, we'll move forward, and our next presenter is uh, Ms., uh, uh, Assistant City Attorney Danny Brown, and he'll be covering assessment law uh, the rights of the city and the rights of the property owner. Welcome, Danny. Thank you, Councillor.
That's right. My name is Danny Brown. I'm one of the assistant city attorneys, and I'll be speaking with you tonight on special assessments and financing of infrastructure improvements. Uh, the relevant statutes that I think that pertain to what we're talking about uh, were handed out uh, to you folks earlier. They've also been put online, uh, as Albert has mentioned. A um, couple points of clarification. There are two statutes in that packet, and there are 943.86 and 943.87. That the packet that you folks back there got uh, have an old version of the law. Those two laws were amended in 2016, and I didn't catch that that amendment wasn't put in the new packet until today. So as it stands right now, what's online has been corrected. So 943.86 and 943.87 is accurate. Um, but if you're looking at it in the audience, you might note that what's said there might be something different than what I say tonight. With respect to 943.86, um, the last sentence in that statute uh, has been changed or added. Uh, one sentence has been added, and that's a protest statute. And I'll cover that in my slide presentation. With respect to 943.87, that change was probably less significant. Um, a word used to be in there in the first sentence that was executed, and that word has been changed to signed. Um, not a real big difference. I think it was just more of a clear up of, uh, of the word, words and language there. But you also note, just so you guys uh, don't think we're not providing you with all the statutes, it starts with 943.75 because every law in that chapter up to uh, 75 has been repealed, which means they've been revoked or removed. They're no longer in force. So the package you have is all the laws under this um, special assessment chapter 943. Okay? The purpose of special assessment. Special assessments are a financial mechanism that allow payment for local improvements. Uh, special assessments can be used alone in financing a project, or they can be combined with general funds, bonds, or other financing mechanisms. Um, special assessments fund local improvements. Well, local improvements are defined in the special assessment chapter as means the process of building, altering, repairing, improving, or demolishing any local infrastructure facility, including any structure, building, or other improvement of any kind to real property, the cost of which is payable from taxes or special assessments. I will note that um, assessments um, can be used whether or not a property is being annexed, um, but assessments are also um, associated with annexation on some level. And where it comes into play to be relevant is if you recall at our last meeting we talked about, well, if you want to annex a property and it's city initiated, what do you have to do? Well, at some point you have to pass a resolution of intent to annex. And I kind of went through some of the requirements that are, are required to, to uh, go through that resolution of intent to annex. And two of them is, as you'll see, you have to provide in a study and in the resolu resolution that there's ample and suitable resources existing to accommodate the order, orderly growth and development. Uh, the special assessment can be used as the ample and suitable resource. So sometimes when a property is annexed, that uh, intent to um, annex will indicate that these improvements, some portion of them in some respect, are going to be paid through future assessments. And the second requirement that I'll note is when you do the resolution of intent to annex, you have to provide the approximate cost of extending that service to those folks. And so as you do the potential assessment, you have to come up with those values. And within that document itself, you give the residents that you're annexing an idea of what the cost is going to be to them. So that's how assessments are, can be relevant to annexation. I have a question. On uh, number one, it's a, ample and suitable resources exist to accommodate the orderly growth and development of the contiguous territory. What you're saying is the resources, the city has to have the resources to do what they say they're going to do? Is that what, to, to afford that? Uh, you're not saying that the residents, you see where I'm going with that? Yeah, I do. I, I think what you're saying is, does the city have to make sure they have that money in the bank to be able to pay for those That's what that statute says, right? No, it doesn't say what that. It say? What it says is 
the city has to have some mechanism to pay for those improvements, whether it's the general fund, whether it's passing bonds, whether it's issuing Or whether they assessment. assess the citizens. Or whether they assess the citizens. Okay. Correct. Okay, as was just demonstrated, this is a rather informal setting. You do not have to ask me as the chair of the committee permission. That's quite all right. And that's exactly what, how we want it. If you have a question, ask. And when Danny's done, we'll certainly ask more questions as well. Remember, when we're bringing uh, property within the city, uh, we're required to provide substantial equivalent services. And so when we talk about what's the cost of annexation and we're giving those indications to residents of what we're going to have to charge them, we have to keep in mind that when we bring them in, the services that they're going to get, they need to be substantially equivalent in standard and scope to services being provided to property that are in the city at the time of the annexation. To, to that point, though, substantially equivalent. I mean, it, let's say there's a neighborhood that's really, um, they really value their character and they want, you know, maybe sewer, but they don't want sidewalk. They don't want a lot of other things. Is that, that would be acceptable? Well, uh, on some level, there can be um, some give and take, but and like when you discuss sidewalks, and we'll talk about that later at a different task force meeting, but there might be some ADA requirements that require the landowners to have certain sidewalks on their property. So that might be an issue that you can't give and take with. As far as the sewer goes, um, you know, if you're, we have city ordinances that require hookups if you're within the city and you have a septic tank within a certain amount of time. Uh, as far as keeping the character of the neighborhood, that, that's indeed possible because um, substantially similar, uh, you know, that can be or substantially equivalent. There's some room, room there to work with that definition. There's no concrete definition of what it is. There's no minimum standard set except for what our standards for development and building are that we set for the city and otherwise stated in state code. So there could be uh, an avenue to keep some of the property in the nature that it is in now. It would just depend on a case by case basis. Okay. One more on my part. Equivalent means, um, okay, if it doesn't mean that you have to, I just want to be clear in this in my mind, uh, it doesn't say that you have to be, to offer anything more than what they currently have. It says the equivalent. In other words, all you're guaranteeing is that the neighborhood isn't going to go backwards. Is that correct? Would that be illegal? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say going backwards. It, what I it's got to stay the same or go forward. Right, it, it probably needs to go forward. I wouldn't say it needs to stay the same. It, it says equivalent. That means the well, same. Services to be substantially equivalent to what's in place in the city at the time you bring the property in the city. Okay. And so if you follow me there? Mm hmm Okay. Thank you. An important distinction there. Yeah. So what's the process to get um, a special assessment? It can be city initiated or it can be a city uh, can accept petitions from landowners for improvements to be assessed against their property if their property is benefiting from those improvements. Um, typically, they're city-initiated assessments, um, but that's not always the case. If you're going to do a city-initiated or uh, accept a petition, you still have to go the pro through the process of what's called a resolution of necessity. And the resolution of necessity is something that has to come before the council uh, and it has to be approved if any portion of the improvements going to be financed by an assessment. What a resolution of necessity requires is a public hearing. Uh, the draft would come before the city council. There would be a hearing date. That draft resolution would include things like the general nature of the improvement, the materials going to be used, the estimated total cost, the description of the class of lots to be assessed, the method of apportioning the benefits and, and details there, and uh, the notice has to state that the plans, plans and specifications can be reviewed at the finance office. When determining what amount you can assess an individual, uh, you have to rely upon our state law. Uh, special assessments can be assessed in the amount equal to the special benefit received by the property benefiting from the local improvements after investigation by the governing body to determine the amount of benefit from construction of the local improvement to the lots and tracks fronting or butting the improvements. I have a question there, Danny. Yes. 
What does it take to prove that the property is benefiting? Well, that's a good question and doesn't have a great answer uh, or a defined answer um, that you can go to and look in a book and say um, the Supreme Court has said this is a benefit or state law that says this is a benefit. And I, I've got a slide that kind of goes through some of, of what can be a special benefit. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later and I think it'll be easier at that point to answer your question. So if I forget and I don't answer it well enough, just remind me please. There's really two ways uh, in state law. Well, state law gives us guidance, two ways to kind of determine what that special benefit or calculation amount can be. There's one particular statute, 943.78, that says you can calculate uh, the benefit by dividing the total cost of the improvement by the number of the feet fronting or abutting the improvement and use that quotient to assess the uh, assess the front foot upon the property fronting or abutting the improvement. So you're basically taking the total, total cost of the, the, the project, dividing it by the square footage, and then assessing that pro rata uh, to each front, front, unit, front uh, frontage owner. The other, the other uh, statutes basically says um, you can assess up to the point of the benefit derived. And so the governing body has to determine what actual specific benefit is of the construction of that specific piece of, piece of property that's gonna be involved in the assessment process. The, uh, the distinction between these two statutes is one talks about front footage um, and the other one talks about just determining that that's the special benefit value. Whatever your assessment is, it can't be greater than the special benefit value to that property. So if you're gonna use the front footage calculation value, the governing body still has to make a determination that there's some special benefit to this property and the benefit is this amount. But instead of using what that special benefit is, we're gonna use front footage because we think that's an easier calculation. Now, if that calculation turns out to be higher than what the governing body determines as a special benefit, then you can't use that. So then you have to use the actual special benefit. Some measurable special benefits, and I think you've asked this question. The obvious one is increase in market value. If you get a realtor or a broker or somebody come in that tells you because of the special assessment this property's gone up in this value, that's a pretty key and easy way to say um, what special value, what a special benefit is. The other ones, they're not as concrete. Uh, future prospects and reasonable expectations of the future use, realize aesthetic, aesthetic value, relief from a burden, uh, an improvement that allows you to continue to use the land. Um, the measure of special benefits doesn't have to be exact or actual monetary benefit, but needs to have a fair degree of exactness. Um, it, and that may or may not be helpful, um, but when you talk about special benefit, that's part of the um, resolution of a necessity that comes before the governing body. Uh, normally some type of study is done, information is provided, and some type of analysis has to be done. By the, at, at some point, the uh, city council has to make an analysis to determine what that special benefit is. Um, and it could be based on the presentation they receive, uh, whether it, you know, people are in support of it or not. It could be based on um, real estate appraisals. Uh, it can be based on prior studies. Um, it's really open, and what we know is that there's a great deal of discretion in making that determination, and the Supreme Court will give deference to what a city council determines as long as it's not arbitrary or capricious. There's a presumption that whatever the city council determines as a special benefit, that that determination is legitimate. Um, so that's where you start from for measuring special benefits. Um, Danny, if you could just go back for a second. I, I may have a question, and it might be actually directed towards uh, to Councillor Selberg. If you could go back that previous slide. In terms of increase in market value, I mean, it's difficult to determine market value before the benefits are in place and any property has gone up for sale, but am I correct in assuming that you would do a market value based on other, other properties elsewhere in the city that have those same type of amenities? Well, yeah, if you're doing a market analysis of that type, you'd 
find one that's comparable or has what you'd be putting into this one, I'm assuming. That's what you're asking, right? Just finding. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously you can't do it for that subdivision or that particular property until the amenities are there or the, the improvements are there. And you have to essentially go through a process of what is this property worth now if somebody was going to purchase it, assuming these improvements were made based on the area that this home is in or this land is at, what would the value be at that point? And that could give you a number that you could use to um, justify the measure of benefit for that property. How, how, how is the special benefit amount allocated among the properties within the area that's being annexed? Is it, is it then allocated equally or is it allocated based on size or are there different benefits within the within the area well if you're there certainly could be different benefits within the area yeah. if you did an analysis and you were able to determine um, what the special benefit was on a more global level and you could and you could determine that the special benefit is at least a certain amount for each household mm -hmm. then you could divide it out in some fair rationale using the square footage scenario. But when you determine um, what's the value per house by a market appraisal, I mean, you would essentially have to go out and appraise like homes and get a value, what they would be worth before the improvement, like homes with the improvement afterwards. And you could group them in and um, use that as a basis for the value of the special benefit. If you had a, if you were annexing a, a property that was on the border of ag or would be classified as a quote unquote an acreage and being in the city caused that value, the appraised value to go down, would the assessment go down? Well, I don't think if you're talking about special assessment to I'm talking about appraised value and aesthetic appeal and all that. If you, if a broker's opinion said that we reduced the, per, the value of a person's acreage, if the machinery can make it go up, can it make it go down? That's my question. Well, the answer to your question is in a way, I believe, I, I want to be clear. If you do an analysis and you determine that bringing this property into the city and making them do these improvements reduce the value of this home and this land, then you can't make them pay an assessed value. They've, they've obtained no assessed value. So there's got to be a special benefit. And that, that's a good point. So I mean, you actually ha should have an appraisal before and then considering the after as well, too. So you have comparables? Based on, based on all the, the input that I've gotten from all the people in my own area, Wayne Township, um, everybody's got an evaluation or a special question, and I think that's what we really need to answer, you know, whether it's, if, if it's gonna go forward with, in a peaceable manner, if you mm -hmm. know what I mean. Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. that, that, that's one of the issues that this task force has to determine is how are we gonna value special benefit? What's fair? What's not fair? What's fair for everybody? Is every situation the same? Well, uh, can I ask it, another question about yes. that? Special benefit to whom? It would be the prop be the property owner, the owners of the property. Current that, property owner. Correct. Interesting. Okay, go ahead and continue, Danny. Sure. So uh, once you start moving forward with the resolution of necessity, that's, that's a uh, resolution that has to come before the council just like any other resolution. Uh, we have to give notice of the time and place. The notice has to specifically state uh, objections will be considered by owners of the property. They have to publish that uh, once, not less than 10 or more, not, not less than 10, no more than 20 days before the hearing date. Um, the notice of hearing is also mailed to the property owners. Uh, we go through the Department of Equalization to determine who the registered property owners are. So you're not just getting notice by publication, you're also getting notice uh, in the mail, by first class mail or certified mail. Uh, and these are state law requirements. We can make these more strict if we want them. These are, these are the minimum. So that's the other thing. If, if we're talking about what's a, what's a benefit and do we need to make sure that's fair? We need to, we can also discuss what's fair notice. Uh, so certified mail, does it have to be signed for or just has to be sent? It just has to be certified sent. It doesn't have to be signed for. Well, I believe certified mail is always signed for or there's a record that it's received, but return receipt, no. return receipt requested is when you actually get a slip back. Um, 
I'm, and I'm just saying that off the top of my head, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but we don't get or we don't send out return receipt requested. We don't do that. So it can be sent by certified mail or first class mail. And so the copy of the notice of hearing has to be sent to the property owners that also has along with it the proposed resolution of necessity. So they know um, what's all on there, what we're planning on doing and, and, how, and they have the opportunity to appear at the hearing if they'd like. Once that resolution of necessity comes before the body, uh, it can be approved or it can be amended or it can be denied. If it's amended by the body and they include by that amendment a different property owner that wasn't given notice, then we have to restart the process and we have to give that notice. So at the resolution of necessity hearing, you can make an amendment as long as you're not amending it to bring somebody in that didn't get notice. So if somebody came and complained and you excluded them for whatever reason, or you reduced uh, what you were doing or changed the, the project somehow, that'd be okay as long as you gave notice to those people that were impacted. After the, uh, the body determines that they wanna go move forward with the, the uh, resolution of necessity, it becomes affected after 20 days after it's been published, unless a referendum has been invoked or unless a protest has been filed. You'll note here that there's basically two ways to protest the resolution of a necessity, the referendum, or 55% of the frontage owners being assessed can file a petition. As long as they file that petition within 20 days, it has to come back before the city council. If they don't file a petition, then the governing board can go out and start entering into contracts for that improvement, and then at some point they can go through the levy and collect on their special assessments as long as they're satisfying state and local law. Now, this is one of the statutes that I noted earlier, and that was, um, 943.86, prior to 2016, if you were 55% of the owners being assessed of that property and you filed a petition, you could just tell a city that we don't wanna be assessed and that protest um, would stop the action and the city council couldn't go through with, this, with its assessment. This law was changed in 2016, which allows the resolution of necessity to come back to city council and if the city council wants to approve it, they can as long as two thirds of the body approve of the resolution of necessity. So if it comes back in front of the body and they approve it, then um, the city can go forward with the, the local improvements uh, that it contemplated previously. Is there, is there any other, because I, I want to make it, I want it clear for everybody that's listening or here, is there any other machinery, legal machinery, once it's passed by the council after a protest that can unwind annexation. Is there the any other legal to that, The answer to that is yes. Okay. And I want to be careful with my answer because I, I work for the city and I represent the people involved with the city. We do, we all do. And, and people behind me shouldn't rely upon my advice for their legal opinions. Right. I, I am sure there's smarter attorneys than me that can think of ways to fight these things, but I can tell you that you can always make a constitutional challenge or- Beyond or, that, I, I don't think anybody here wants to do a constitutional challenge. Uh, if you're, I'm asking, is there a typical, uh, reasonable and customary way to challenge that annexation? Because these are the questions that we're gonna be asked. If it's not by referendum and if it's not by that protest, um, then, then there's no other legal challenge before the body, the city city council that you can make to contest that. So the only thing that you're saying is if we could somehow bring it to a vote, and I don't know how that process works, and, and I don't know how that would, was that another petition process or? Well, once the resolution of necessity is passed, it becomes law, um, you know, um, if, at that point, you know, you, you'd have to you seek uh, relief in, in circuit court somehow. Now, once the resolution of necessity goes forward, then there's another step that we're getting to where um, you go forward with um, filing your assessment role. And the assessment role is the, I don't wanna say important part of the, pro the part process, but it's a second pro part of the process because the resolution of necessity tells you, you know, we're going to assess you a certain amount, we're gonna do these assessments for these improvements and we have a general idea that it's gonna be this much, it's the approximate amount. 
And then what comes after that is either the work is done or it's not done, but at some point, uh, an assessment role is filed with city finance and they move forward with the city council asking the city council to authorize this assessment role that determines the amount of the assessment per person per property. Okay, so there would be discussion beyond, you know, once the decision was made, people could go to the council or whatever to discuss the whole thing. Or right, there would be concerns. one more kind of uh, bite at the apple, so to speak, at the assessment role hearing, mm -hmm. because you, you do the resolution necessity, it goes forward. Customarily and generally, those improvements are made, done, a final bill is presented to the city, and then the city finance office files what's called an assessment role. That assessment role kind of, it, it, it uh, shows in particular who's being assessed, what amount for what project and what parcels. Once the city finance officer gets that, um, then they have to have a hearing to approve it. Uh, they have to publish that notice of the hearing before the city council, just like the resolution of necessity, give the same folks the same notice, the same time frame, and they have to come before the city council and anybody who has an issue with the amount that they're gonna be assessed can once again voice their objections to it at that time. So there's a lot of machinery available to discuss the details or if, if you're not happy with the assessment or et cetera through the council. Before your property gets assessed, a dollar amount that you're gonna have to pay some point in the future, there's gonna be at least two hearings in front of the, in front of the city council where the city council has to approve some type of resolution. So there's there an annexation. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So there are mechanisms. Yep. But I want to be very clear. If you have an issue of what you're being assessed, you shouldn't wait. And I'm giving legal advice to people I don't represent, and it's free legal advice. So I'll take it for what it's worth. You shouldn't <laughs> wait to the last minute. You should be involved in the process like you're involved now. Exactly. Okay. One, one, one last question out of me. Um, is there, when, when annexation, uh, is there a study or a report that's got to be submitted to the state? for the area that's, uh, that you're planning to annex? There's not a study that's submitted to the state. There's a study that's submitted to the city council for annexation. Okay, is that, that, is that study public record? It is. Okay. For uh, a uh, initiated uh, civilian or a, a voluntary annexation, there's a study done that's not in as detail as a city initiated. The city initiated is it's got more detail to it, and it's it's always submitted and it's always reviewed. Thank you. Say so one just quick clarification: the, the the resolution of necessity, the city does not have to assess the annexed area for 100 percent of the improvements. That resolution can provide that the city will pay some, all, or part, or a, a certain proportion of the cost. Correct. You're, you're absolutely correct. It, the assessment can be any portion of it. Okay. Full part, 50%, whatever, whatever the city council thought was appropriate. So in his statement, you, I need you to clarify from this, me because this is one of the uh, contentious arguments in our area. You're saying that the, I want you to repeat the, the, the assessment uh, does not have to be assessed to the land, to the no, the resident, city can, the landowner, I mean, the city can assume the whole if yeah, they the choose to do so? Be, finance in total or in part by special assessment. If it is deemed expedient for the municipality to assume and pay any portion of the cost of the improvement, the proposed resolution may so, provi pro may so provide. So they have the latitude to do whatever they basically they have want latitude as far to as pay. subsidizing anything that exactly. goes on. Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. In that resolution necessity process, the city council determines what amount, if any, what amount, if any, it wants to assess for those improvements. If it's not 100% of the special benefit, it doesn't have to be. If it's 25%, they can determine that. If they've got money from other some other project that was left over and they wanna put it into this, whatever it is, they could do that. So you're absolutely right. It doesn't have to be the full amount. It could be any amount that they determine appropriate. But Danny, in a case that they decided to do that, would you have opened yourself up to problems because you wouldn't have treated other landowners the same way? 
Exactly. You want to be very consistent. You want to be consistent and fair and, I hate to say it, predictable so people know what, so people have a realistic expectation of what the city is going to do. You're right. But so is that, a, is that a reason the city would want to, out, to assess at 100% because then they can say, we always assess that way. We don't give, we don't ever pay part of it for other people. I mean, I would question that if you came to me and said, I'm, I, we're not going to help you. You get to pay 100 percent, but, but we're going to help Jeff, and we're going to we're going to pay half of what's happening at Jeff's. You know, I think it's I think it's uh, fair to say that the city tries to pay more than the hundred. The, the city tries to participate in the cost of the improvements, and I would say that assessing at 100 percent of the special benefit is probably not the way to go. The best way is to reduce it some way. Um, just because, you know, assessments at some point can be challenged, the amounts and the, the numbers that you determine. If you're always assessing at 100% of what you think the special benefit is, it might be easier for a court to say, you know, you've probably overreached your boundary on this one. Mm -hmm. But if you reduce it to 75%, or whatever that might be, or you think is reasonable, then you can help shoulder some of that cost to the person you're bringing in or being assessed for the public improvement, and you can help solidify your position if it's ever contested later on. So, so that makes me think of another question. Are you assessing to recover the cost of making the improvement? Are you assessing for the perceived benefit? Well, what you're trying to do is making sure you're not assessing any more than the, the perceived special benefit that the person is getting. A lot of these projects, and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in the um, public works department, but a lot of these pro projects are part of something else, or maybe it's part of something bigger. And so they're already there doing something, and so they're gonna, you know, if they're doing groundwork, they're gonna pay some of that on their own dime. Or they got people out there doing one part of it they're going to incorporate that into the assessment process. So in my your experience, is the actual cost of putting a five-lane road in front of someone's house higher or lower than the perceived benefit? I'd say that in my experience, the actual cost is higher than the perceived benefit when, in, in generally. But... Go ahead and continue. It's just like when I uh, add on to my home, I might spend $20,000 to put an extra room on. And I go to sell two weeks from then, and I only get, you know, the $10,000. So, um, and I will also say, too, you know, benefit to property is, is in the eye of the beholder as well. You know, some people don't see it, and some people do. Um, and that's why sometimes, that's why we've always worked towards um, voluntary annexations working with owners, trying to agree on a fair number that's workable, putting some skin in the game ourselves, um, and trying to get something that works. Uh, once we have the hearing on the assessment role, um, that becomes effective if there's no appeal taken within 20 days. Uh, that appeal has to be made to circuit court. And it's 20 days from the effective date of the resolution and 20 days from the date the notice is sent out to the property owners. So whichever date is later, but it's 20 days from those two dates. Once it becomes final and nobody, nobody's contested that assessment role, that assessment uh, becomes a lien on your property. And whatever that amount is, the first payment is due January 1st following the date of the approval of the assessment role, and then every um, first day of January thereafter until it's paid in full. Uh, installment payments are included in taxes collectible on the year in which the installment is due. Assessments are collected the same way um, our real estate taxes are. We um, pass a city ordinance 2914 that sets the interest rates on these assessments and it also extended the length of time that you could um, have the payback. Um, it can be up to 20 years on an assessment and the interest on that is the Federal Reserve Bank constant maturity uh, value plus 2%. I spoke with T Tracy Turbach, 
director of finance and he indicated to me that those were the current rates at this point. So if we were gonna do an assessment today, if it was getting approved and you were gonna be charged interest on your amount, uh, if you were between 15 to 20 years on a payback period, it would be 5%. Okay, if that 5% value there includes the 2% that we add on pursuant to our ordinance. When was that ordinance passed? I believe it was, what's that? 2014, thanks Albert. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that ordinance has been provided to you in your packet. Uh, I think it's the last page of the statutes. <clears throat> now there's one other uh, thing that can happen. Uh, we're talking about mechanisms. Once you've gone through the two resolutions, uh, once the assessment rule is, is filed and um, approved, a person can petition uh, city council to waive or reduce the special assessment levied against them if it satisfies the state statute which is you have to be owner-occupied owner single-family dwelling, you have to be the head of the household 65 years of age or older or disabled, or if your annual income does not exceed the federal poverty level. So that's a way that you can uh, petition city council to reduce that assessment, waive it, forgive it. Um, that's another mechanism. Questions? Any other questions? Is, a, is charging interest, is that mandatory? Um, I, I believe the statute just says uh, the municipality, I think it says may charge interest. Okay. I, don't, I don't think we'd have to charge interest if we didn't want to, I'd have to double check. Um, but I, I don't think we'd have to. And the 20 years is, I mean, they, that's different from different assessments too, or are they always out that 20 year? Well, our city, or by state law, you can actually run out um, assessments 40 years. But um, since we're a home rule charter, we can make our rules more stringent if we'd like. And that city ordinance makes the, the longest you can have the assessment 20 years. And I can't tell you what most, um, assessments are for what period of time, but I certainly feel personally that there's a trend to allow people as much time as they could possibly have at the lowest interest rate we could give them. So I think there's a trend to have 20 years on a repayment plan. Would the city council have the authority to adjust those rates then? If they... Yeah, the city council could amend that ordinance by amending their they'd have to go through that process. I'd have to check too, Counselor, whether or not there's a requirement for interest. I just don't think there is, but I've never read those statutes. I looked at whether or not you can charge it. I've just always known we have, so I can double check that and get back to you. Danny, if a property is sold before the assessment is, is um, the 20 year period, for instance, is complete, does that property have, owner have to pay 100% of that assessment off or can it be passed on to the new homeowner if there's 10 years remaining? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it, it, it can be passed on. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lien on the property. So when somebody comes to purchase your property, if they do a title, title search and try to get title insurance, they're going to see that that lien's there and those payments are required. And so what, what might happen is your home, if you're trying to sell it, you might have to sell it for less and take into consideration that lien. Uh, unlike a mortgage with a bank, uh, it would, you know, it's more likely that you know someone might accept that property and pay those amounts, but that's just the free market. But you could sell it subject to those liens. There's no requirement that you'd have to take it with you, and it's not a personal obligation. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next up on our agenda is Mr. El Elbert Schmidt, and he's gonna be talking about the uh, financial impact of annexation. Albert's getting his presentation up and welcome, Albert. Thank you, Council, or th thank you, Task Force. So, um, my topic for this evening is kind of a three prong area, basically touching on taxation. An exciting topic that everybody loves to talk about. We're going to talk about three main areas tonight. We're going to talk about property tax change, the cost of infrastructure improvements, um, additional annual fees. So. The tax levy is the first side of it. Then we'll talk about, when we talk about these assessments, um, what kind of costs 
could they be if we're looking at full values and those kind of things, give people ballpark ideas. And then we'll talk about the annual fees. Uh, I try to give people a full idea of what kind of financial change they're gonna occur if they get annexed in so they're not surprised by something. Ideally, we don't wanna have somebody have something happen where they go, I didn't know this was coming up. So we talk about property tax. It's collected by the auditor, county auditor. It's um, calculated by the auditor, sorry, it's collected by the treasurer. So these are all county functions, not city functions. Um, and ultimately, when you look at this, the levies vary depending on your township, what city, what county, what school district the property is located in. So all those factors play a role in determining what your levy or your mill rate is. And a property will pay that tax for a township or a city, but they won't pay both. So if you get annexed in, you won't pay the township levy anymore because you're annexed in. You'll pay the city levy. If you're not in the city, you won't pay the city levy, you'll pay the township levy. Um, then taxes, as you may be aware, are kind of a year lagging. So property taxes you're paying this year were actually for last year. So one important things to note here in that side of it. When we're gonna break this down into a total of four different areas. We're gonna look at Minnehaha County and Lincoln County. We're gonna look at the rural county versus the urban county or the annexed versus the unannexed. So when you look at the rural county for Minnehaha, there's a total of six levies that get added up and put on that mill rate. Uh, the blue color, the ones on the left here, uh, represent the ones that are rural county only. So once annexation had happened, those would be removed. So you wouldn't pay those. Again, it's township, rural fire, rural library. Those are Minnehaha rural county um, tax levies. And then the other ones that the rural counties pay are the county tax, the water protection, and the school districts. Those three county water protection school districts would not change regardless of status. So now we're gonna get into the really fun thing, the numbers, and it's a really small sheet. Everybody has in their handout um, a larger version of this with all the numbers and information. But this first slide, I'm gonna kind of break down how to read it real quick for you, and then we won't do it again throughout the presentation. But um, again, as we said, for all these areas, um, the county, the water protection, the rural fire, and the rural libraries, those are all constants amongst all these properties in Minnehaha County. And then the levy rate changes just basically depending on the location. So what school district are you in? What township are you in? <coughs> so the townships are identified on the very top in those columns. So you got Benton, Maple, Brandon, Wayne, Sioux Falls, and Split Rock. The school districts are identified here in the, well, in the row right below it. So you got Sioux Falls, Tri-Valley, West Central, Brandon, Lenox, T, and um, that's all for me, haha. So that's, that's how you read this real quick. And these are kind of the numbers. So I'm gonna go really quick through these numbers without going into expl explicit detail. But these are the rates as of 2016, payable in 2017. So when you look at that, this one, the range was Benton Sioux Falls School District at 12.604 to the highest of Wayne with T School District at 15.509. So again, that, that's the levy rate, so that's for every thousand dollars of value of the house, you're getting taxed 15, or uh, the $15. Now when you go to urban Mihaha, so you're switching group, this is after annexation, what would change? You're gonna be down to four total levies instead of six. And the only one that's constant, that's only an urban only one is the city tax. So the city Sioux Falls levy is the only one that would change, that would come on that you wouldn't get if you weren't in, but those other three dropped off because they were rural only. So again, county, school, and water stayed on, they were there. Uh, so then this is this urban breakdown for you on that one. Um, this one ranged from 16.518 to 19.181. So then we'll go into Lincoln County, the rural version of Lincoln County. Uh, it's a little different than Mayhaha County. They have four total levies, two of which are county only. That's the rural fire in the township and the county levy and the school district levies stay the same regardless of annexation status. That's the numbers for there as well. And so you can see this one ranges from 12.171 to 16.238 for 2016 taxes payable in 2017. Now and this is per thousand, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you take your, so if you had a $100,000 house, you divide it by a thousand, then you times that times this to get how much you actually pay. 
Um, so then urban Lincoln County, you have four total as well. This one's a little different because with Lincoln County in the urban area, once you get annexed in, you also add in water protection. I mean, Haha County, you pay it regardless if you're urban or rural. Lincoln County, you only pay it if you're urban, if you're in Sioux Falls. So that's one other one. It's not a major one. If you look at it here, uh, 0 0.025. So compared to all the others, um, it's quite a bit smaller, but it is there. Uh, and in this one, when you talk about the urban tax levy in Lincoln County, your range is 15.828 to 19.652. So to summarize all that fantastic math and exciting information that everybody loves to see <coughs> in those kind of forms, um, on average, so taking all of the school districts, all of the townships and averaging it out there, um, if you use the median house value of 157,800, which came from the US Census Bureau for City of Sioux Falls, you come out to a tax increase of around 563.15 a year, which is approximately just under 26%. So that's kind of our rough estimate um, to cover everybody to go one quick one. Obviously, uh, everybody's individual properties would be different, and through an annexation process, we would provide a more accurate um, estimate based on their actual values. And in case you're wondering the difference and the change there, from a levy rate, um, the low side, you know, when I said the rates there, the low side, the difference is 3.914, and then the high side, from the highest, it was uh, 3.414. So that's kind of how much they changed between urban and rural, and that's what the 26% is. So when you look at the uh, tax levy reduction programs we have out there. So now we've talked about what levies are out there, how they calculate them, how they change when you get annexed, and how school districts affect that and townships affect that. With annexation, um, or even before annexation, we have a program available to us by state law and city ordinance for these agriculture areas. And that's at the discretion and judgment of the city council to put these areas into what we call rural service district which basically says your property is more rural in nature than urban. Um, and there's specific standards in there, but what it does is it keeps those more agriculturally used properties at the ag levy rate, but the levy then is not paid to the township, it's paid to the city. And the rate that that levy is at is supposed to be based on the average of unannexed ag land in adjoining um, townships, so that that amount would be equal to what other people would pay. Would we have the power to, um, and I don't remember if this was asked the last time, would we have the power to essentially tear up somebody's um, uh, property tax? Like, for example, you know, we have a certain city rate, and they're at, they're at some sort of township rate to say, let's say over 10 years we're going to tear you and, and you're going to crawl up to 100% to kind of phase them in, or is it a flip? It depends on how you want to accomplish that. Um, if your goal is getting money back in their pockets to accomplish that same value percentage, I think you have opportunities out there. I'll talk about at the end here a little bit about, but if your goal is to send a tax bill to the assessors to increment slowly up like a tax finance district or something like that, I don't believe you have a mechanism to make it so that every, rate, every year the levy rate will go up by 25% until it's 100%. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, when you're talking about these reduction programs, there are periods when that's all of a sudden going to change, and then the reduction would be lost. You would then be put into the urban time, and that's when you plat, when you're developing, um, or otherwise fail to meet the criteria set by the ordinance. So when you talk about what area, all right, so what is this as a rural service district? Approximately 82 areas around Sioux Falls are identified currently by our ordinance as rural service districts. These currently are areas that are annexed in to city limits, but rural in nature or agriculture still used. Um, one of our most recent ones that we just did, but this one was based off of um, one of our most rec more recent annexations over on Southeastern and 57th Street is a rural service district. And if you go out there, you'd see they're far most of it and there's horses on the other side of it. So it's very rural in nature. So to clarify, to clarify, to clarify for me, if there's 20 acres that's annexed into the city that's strictly ag right now, 
How is it assessed at a lower rate, or what would the, if you were assessing that? Are you going through this program? Or, I mean, if you, if you go through this rural service district program and get approved by the state council, then you would, your rates basically wouldn't change okay. from before that. So what happens when that, that acreage is plotted and sold and developed? Then you would change your, uh, to urban service. You'd, your but tax what about an increase. assessment for the, the sewer, the water hookup? This is all that. only for taxation. This is only for the tax levy. Okay. Yeah. If, if you had um, a larger acreage, several acres with a house on it, can that be a rural service district or just having a residential house preclude it, therefore? Well, the main part of this one is in the judgment of the state council, um, as long as it meets certain criteria. Typically, we're looking at a minimum of 50% of the land is going to be used agriculturally. Okay, so obviously if they were farming it and, you know, and it happened to obviously have a house on it, we could make that judgment. It's, yeah, there's, it's a, allowed in the ordinance for judgment by the council, so for that side, as long as it meets certain criteria. So if it was just a one-acre house and they had a patch of a garden in the back, you probably wouldn't pass muster on that one. But, you know, if you're, if you're looking at you have horses on a 10-acre area and you only have one house on there, if in the judgment of the state council that's in there, you probably have the likelihood of being able to do that. Okay. Um, so the other things to note here uh, when you're looking at this map we talked about these properties can come off this rural service district um, status. And so some of the areas when you look at that map, it might be kind of hard from the background, but it is an attachment on our website, but also handed out. Um, some of the areas that are going to probably come off here in the near future, Lake Lorraine, uh, if this are already off, the Sanford Sports Complex, University Hills up on the west, and then also, as I mentioned here in the text, uh, the new Avera Complex, once that starts get going, those areas will come off of the rural service district and then go into the regular tax. So now a summary for you um, on the rural service districts. Kind of went over it as we talked a little bit, but um, you know, we don't determine the tax. That's a county uh, service that they determine what that average tax would be based on the abutting townships. But we would receive that reduced tax levy, um, whereas the township wouldn't after annexation. Um, overall, the goal of this is to go, you're very much still rural in nature, you're still kind of a farm, you're still kind of this. We don't want to change your taxes just because we brought you in because you're not really receiving any additional benefit than you would have before as a, as a farm. You don't have any new development, you don't have any new services to this undeveloped land. Um, and so that's where taxes for the property owner in, this, in these instances that are identified by the state process would remain the same pretty much. Albert, um, yeah. um, does that include police and fire? Well, you're Police and fire um, service would change. Get police protection. If you're annexed in, you're going to be protected by our um, fire service and our police service. Um, so that that size, um, you're still, if you're annexed in, you're protected. If you're not, um, then you're either protected by the county services or uh, if we have an agreement for protected services. Uh, Albert, is that a, a potential? I mean, we've been talking mostly tax right now. And uh, even though it's a three-letter word, most people in the audience probably view it as a four-letter. Um, are there possible benefits such as fire? Uh, the Sioux Falls Fire Department has an ISO rating of one. And uh, I've, I've been informed that a rating, of the difference between one and a nine ISO, ISO could be almost 100% in your insurance uh, premium that you're paying on, on your home. So are there other benefits such as that or uh, city water versus rural water or anything else that you can think of? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the benefits out there that we try to really promote to, um, to people out there, a lot of the benefits that we have out there, people don't really perceive right away, but the fire is a very good one, although in that instance sometimes they might actually be realizing that savings already because they might be really close to sea limits and they might already be saving because of that service. So they're kind of getting that benefit already. Um, police service, it depends on who you talk to, whether they like the, what they have with the, with the county or not. But if you look at the services that Sioux Falls Police offer, uh, they have a wide variety of services and a wide variety of officers to help out with different levels of service, whether it be just patrol to investigation. And so hopefully, you wouldn't have to utilize those services that they offer in the, that maybe the county doesn't quite have. But if you did, it would be there. Similar to ambulance service also. I'm not trying to say one's is better than the other, but 
when you have, are you in out, are you in state limits or are you out state limits? Sometimes when you call 911 in an emergency, they have to make, every split second can help and make a big difference. And they have to make a determination, are you in state limits, so we call this service, or are you out of state limits, so we call this service. So anytime we can reduce the amount of pockets that you have or of spots where they have to make that call, um, should save seconds and potentially save lives. Um, so they can just go, hey, it's in this area, it's west of this or whatever, it's easy, it's this one service, we don't have to make the call. Um, then in addition to that, we also like to throw out there that you know you get a vote in local elections, and typically most people care mostly about probably presidential elections, but everybody knows that really the people who make the most amount of changes that affect your day-to-day -day lives are the city council uh, on the local basis, so you get a say um, in those kind of proceedings and processes there so okay. we try to say that but again it's still it's a money factor sure so in this side of it we're gonna go over now to the infrastructure estimate costs um, I can try to explain as best I can um, if we need more detail we can definitely get back to you with after talking with our public works department about it but we've gotten some comments from already on this stuff so hopefully we have most of the answers for you but if you're looking at cost improvements, and I'm not saying you're assessing all this back, but just to say this, if you were going to do 100%, these are kind of the rates that you'd be potentially looking at. So when we give estimates to people for improvements, we typically give them these amounts, and we also are usually pretty conservative with these amounts. So hopefully these estimates are actually higher than what reality would come in at. In the idea of, we don't know what those costs are for sure going to be, so if we, if we are conservative, it's a better deal than we, if we tell somebody a lower number and they've planned for it, and then all of a sudden we hit them with a higher price tag. Um, that's a much harder pill to swallow than me telling you, hey, it's going to cost you 100 bucks, and come down, it's only 90 bucks. So with that being said, the amounts. Um, rural, rural section road, we estimate typically 6250 per foot per side. And then we talk about a local urban road, and I say all in there. That means curb, gutter, sidewalks, lights, storm sewer, um, sump pump collection system. I mean, every, the full typical section that you would see in a new rural development in Sioux Falls, 226 per foot per side. And I'll break that down here in a second if you're wondering how that's broken down. Um, then the next kind of category we run into is uh, properties located on arterial streets because we don't charge arterial street fees back, but we do charge if you have a permanent access for the sidewalk assessment. And that's currently estimated around $35 a foot. For the rural section road, is there a minimum width that a rural section road is? Um, typically, I believe there is. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what that um, typical amount is. Um, I'm trying to remember if that would be. I think I might have a slide here that kind of gives you a little better proximity to that width. I, I guess what I'm getting at is if there's existing you know, like a, a subdivision that might have rural section roads. They've got roads. They just may not be the urban standard. If all of our services would, you know, maybe we, in, in a certain case, might say, well, you know, maybe if we were building it new, we would do a local urban roadway, but they've got a section road. It's paved. They can, you know, we can reasonably get through. Could that be an acceptable when you look at our standards, um, there are minimum standards for the for that rural road. Um, so it would depend on the road. Yeah, if it doesn't meet the minimum standard, you might have to expand it out a little bit to meet that minimum standard. Like, um, like widths for fire and, and things like that. And we're assuming it's a public street now, right? Because we have two different standards between public and private, so it really depends. That's sure. where you look into it. You go each each area that we talk about. Again, we're not talking about any specific area here at all, but when mm -hmm. you start really getting down into it, each area is very unique and needs to be considered independently because if the neighborhood wants something and we can work towards that goal together, it might be in their benefit and their desire to be a, more of a private development or if they want to not worry about the snow rule, if they don't want to worry about the street maintenance, they want to be a public area, that might be more in their benefit. So it's, we'd like to usually work with those neighborhoods to figure out what the desire of the neighborhood really is so we can have that flexibility. Okay, and we don't have to do it now, but I would be curious to know, what, you know, like what the what the bare minimum that, that we would think that we would need, you know, to safely annex and service somebody, you know, like the width of the road and certain things, so we all kind of knew what the, maybe what the playing field was, or if that would make sense. Yeah, and I know 
from our public works side, those guys, they know that number, what the minimum standard is. I just apologize, I don't have it memorized Fine. on okay. me. Okay, thanks. Um, and my, my one of the slides in here will maybe kind of give you a little better idea of approximately what that is, but. Um, so these costs um, aren't a comprehensive list of all costs for annexation, uh, for infrastru infrastructure improvements. They kind of vary a little bit, but you know, as you go through, that's what they, what our estimates are. Albert, if you uh, if you live on a say you live on a street, uh, it's gravel, and there's an annexation process, and it's going to go forward, uh, but the construction is not going to start for a year. Um, I think some of the people have been told that. That street has to be brought up to standards anyway for that year. In other words, gravel, uh, bladed, and all that kind of stuff. Is that correct or incorrect? I don't believe that's correct. I believe that if we're going to do an annexation and there's a road project scheduled for the next year out there, it's going to stay gonna leave it that way. Bladed or just I mean, something it, reasonable? Yeah, if, if the... Like in some neighborhoods where there's certain roads that get used a lot and they just become very bumpy, I think the op opportunity for a blading for that season, stuff like that, is definitely out there with our road department as they've done that in the past to them. But I don't believe if we're looking at doing an improvement, we typically don't like to waste people's money or our own money. Old improvements look new. Yeah. That'd be great. So when you talk about the full urban section, here's the breakdown to get to the 226. Uh, $90 for street construction, which does include 18 of which is curb and gutter. So if you kind of wonder what that kind of cost is, 18 bucks per foot per side is kind of our estimate for curb and gutter. Uh, water mains about 50, sanitary sewer 35, storm sewer 35 as well, lighting we figure about $6, and then some pump collection we figure about 10. So, so I, I'm taking this, this is if I just take a bare piece of ground, <coughs> correct? Yeah. Now, now what if we go into an existing area that has houses all over and all kinds of other stuff. I mean, prices presumably could, would they skyrocket? Would they, I this mean. This should be pretty comparable for most of those areas, assuming you have the amount of right away. Typically, we're gonna have this, the amount enough right away for these roads, 66 feet or 60 feet. Even for things like the, the sewer and some of the other stuff, if you have existing infrastructure or driveways in the way and. So we're, we're kind of assuming an average here based on our past experiences, I believe. And so you're kind of just taking average because yeah, the depth and all that stuff definitely plays a role in the costs. But trying to provide just an estimate number for somebody at the very beginning, um, this is what we're trying to start off with so that people get an idea what the ballpark is we're talking about. Because a lot of times what you get into is, I mean, you just, if you don't work with these numbers, you have no idea what we're even thinking about. You know, is it $1,000, is it $100,000? Big difference. Um, so this is a way just to kind of go, we're actually talking, you know, maybe tens of thousands or maybe 5,000, depends on. So it, what you would see is as the project progressed, you would get well past this rough estimate and you would actually get out there. We actually have way better estimates, kind of like we have done in the past with some of our other annexation areas where we really came out to, um, we knew exactly how much the storm sewer was gonna be, then we were able to divide that per front foot and come up with that estimate, so. So, and, and this may be, uh, if you, this is okay with another yes. question. Yes. Um, and this may or may not also be for, for Danny. Um, so one of the ways that we can assess would be based on front footage. But then you run into the corner lot issue. And talking to, interestingly, talking to residential um, builders, when they build a subdivision, what they typically do, at least the ones that I sat down with, is they will actually take that second frontage and they'll apportion that among the other properties so that the corner lots aren't stratospherically more expensive than the rest. Um, and I think that was maybe in play over in, as an option, maybe in like Prairie Meadows. Does state law give you the latitude where we could do something like that, where we could say, we're gonna take that second frontage and we're gonna spread it among everybody <coughs> if people were amenable to that, or could you not do that? Well, if you did a voluntary annexation and you agree that that's how you were gonna apportion it out, you wouldn't have any problems. If you're doing city initiated, you can't uh, portion it out any greater than what the special benefit is. So if your special benefit justifies the amount that ultimately that taxpayer is gonna get, you could probably do that. So it all hinges on who's initiating? Correct. Okay, thanks. I need to clarify one thing too, Albert. I'm looking at this. Um, so if you, if you were gonna get a street, 
you're going to get city water, you're going to get sanitary sewer, you're going to get storm sewer, you're going to get lighting, street lights, fire hydrants, uh, sump pump collection, uh, that curb and gutter, we're looking at $226 a linear foot. Per side, yeah. I tried to put it in a term so that the whole, I mean, that would be, this slide would be your consideration of an, of a maximum ac action, would that be correct? Yeah, this is our, our conservative estimate for a property owner on a fully improved street. That was nothing to start with, it just you went in. It might've been a gravel street prior. Right, travel yeah. street prior, okay. Yeah. And this includes really not utilizing any of that other gravel, so there's a lot of Okay. Hopefully cost savings that we could bring into play, but okay, again. so there'd be some cost savings possibilities in this number. Yeah like again, We're trying to aim high so that we don't shock people with a number higher than what actually comes in. So you're aiming high Okay, that's what I needed to hear mm -hmm. and again. We try to let people know that when we look at our estimates construction costs, we see typically r increase every year three to five percent so we like to warn people that you know if putting something off ten years there is going to be a cost in that coming back that you wouldn't have, you know, you would have had a reduced cost earlier rather than later. So uh, something to kind of note. And, and just, I, I just have to say just something is just an observation. I was talking to somebody on the phone today who was very concerned, and, and this may be an outlier, but um, he has an acreage in one of these um, prominent areas that, that, that we've been talking about, and I, he had five or six hundred feet because he was on a corner lot and the house was you know like a hundred eighty thousand dollars with like a work shed or something like that no you do the math I mean you're a hundred and twenty fifty thousand dollars in assessment on a so I mean that's where the challenge is it's just an observation I'm not asking for you to you know I'm just now that may be extreme but ratios yep so it's tough so when you look at on uh, kind of fully improved street this is kind of a, a drawing of what that typically looks like again just to give you an idea 226 per foot per side here's that street you got the driving in the middle and you got the curbs again you have sewer water you have sidewalks in the uh, outsides 226 per side so for each 33 feet just for your side of the street yeah so if you have a hundred foot frontage Mm -hmm. $100 times You're paying for your half. For your portion, yeah. So the total, I mean, so if you owned both sides of the road, for instance, you would double that. Okay. This is, but typically most people only own one side of the road. Mm -hmm. So okay. you, we're trying to put this in terms so people can see what their cost would be and not try to have to break it down any further. Okay. So that's a full urban section. Uh, now when you look at a rural section here, this is the 6250. Um, this is a rough example I kind of threw in there for you. Um, shows in the, uh, the swales on the side of the road for the water and stuff like that. Shows there's no curb, just has driving area. This does show the pet area in it, so I think it's a little wider than typically. But again, you can kind of see the 24-foot road surface is what we would aim for minimally there. Um, we're having 30 total for a 6-foot pet area. So that's kind of the, the latest thing we've looked at for trying to accommodate um, pedestrians in a rural road section so that's kind of that's the width of the road that we've kind of been really talking about trying to get for a public road so okay all right so now we're gonna move on to the third and final topic for you guys an exciting one of additional annual fees so this is the thing I like to make sure that we explain to people because if you're not in the city limits Sioux Falls you might not be expecting these kind of fees as well so this is above and beyond taxes just so everybody's aware of the financial impact that people would receive. Um, there's street maintenance, there's storm collection, and when you collect them, we could do it annually. Um, right now we have a dollar for street maintenance and we have a rate of 0 .00715 per effective squ square foot. And I can, I'll explain how we figure that out a little better. But. If if I live on a place, which as you know in the city of Sioux Falls, that means a private drive. Typically, not always. Not always, okay. Um, do you, does this get collected since the city doesn't plow it and do things like that? Um, or is there something the city does do? If it's not a public street, you're not going to get a street maintenance fee because you're not receiving any benefit from street maintenance. 
but you're going to receive benefit from a citywide stormwater collection system, so you're going to get the second one. Second one. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we talk about street maintenance, um, the dollar per front foot helps to cover the things, snow removal, sweeping, um, street maintenance, those kind of things. Um, this isn't limited to a dollar, but this is what we're at right now. We haven't raised it for a long time, so I don't envision it being raised, but um, just it should note that this dollar per front foot does not cover the complete costs of providing these services for residents. This is just a portion of and a way to kind of collect some money to help out with some of the services. But we use other payment options to really fulfill that gap. And then properties with more than one street frontage will typically only pay for the smallest street frontage on that fee. So you don't typically get hit twice or three times if you have a triple frontage. Where do those funds come from that the gap you're talking about, where, where does that come from? Either going to pay out of property tax or a sales tax, typically. Okay. Just comes out of our first penny operating fund from the sales and property tax? I believe so. Yeah. But yeah I'd have to, so. I could dig into our finance, or our I, public works guys. They'd I'm pretty sure about it, yes. I, I mean, I can, I can tell you real quick here that from last year's budget, when we talk about street maintenance, you're... Um, taxes that you pay, um, if you have property tax in Sioux Falls, um, of that budget, 6.5% went in to pay for street maintenance. So for instance, I know I don't have the slide up here, but if you had a $200,000 home and your property tax bill was $943, of that $943, you would pay 6126 would have been budgeted for street maintenance. So, so that shortage, your sales tax in essence, even though I'm not in the city limits, I'm contributing to, yeah. And I should also note that snow removal, we broke out differently, so that's an additional 6.7% just for snow removal. So that's, so between the two, you're over 13%. So um, going back to our presentation here, when you look at the stormwater fee, that's an annual fee that ultimately the idea behind it is creating a citywide system to collect stormwater so that you can better kind of during events get that water through the city um, without causing property or causing low property damage as possible. Uh, it's calculated by square feet of property times the multiplier times the rate. Again, that rate that we talked about was 0 0.001715. So you can see on my last one there that if we use an acreage, a one acre area, the annual cost to an acreage would be 179.09 under the current rate. And so those, those rates, when you look at them, by the way, um, are passed by ordinance from city council. Um, and the, the 5.75, which is the multiplier, that varies depending on what your property is, what you're using it as. And that varies from a one for like agricultural lands to an 18.75 for really heavy commercial like parking lots where there's really no impervious areas. So, and then there's other things you can do in this area, but I'm, keeping this very general and very as brief as I can for this stuff. So that's all I have for you on that side of things. Any additional questions? Any additional questions from anyone on the task force of, of Mr. Schmidt? I've just got one on the, the, so basically when you're showing the levy and the tax increase, basically there's a 26% going from not in the city to in the city. There's a 26% increase in taxes. I'm just averaging them all out to make it an easy one number. Yeah, 26. What happens if somebody is on a very limited budget and, I mean, there's just no wiggle room every month? I mean, what happens in those cases, I guess? I'm curious. From, again, not talking about any reduction programs, but from a tax levy discussion, you're either in or you're out. So either you get the city levy or you get the township levy. So that's, that's what changes with an annexation mostly. Okay. Um, and so it's up to then other areas of what other programs are out there. That's where we have the rural residential one. Um, and there are a few other state ones I think out there, but from a state council one, there's, I don't have any way on this side of it, but again, that's not to say that there couldn't be other programs initiated. And the Pardon reason me, I, I ask is, your, excuse me, was your question, your question was, wasn't based solely on the tax assessment, it was ba or, or on the tax increase, it was based on the total assessment and tax, wasn't it? If Correct. they can't afford it, what do they do? Yeah, what happens? What if they have no wiggle room? And my reading from him was you're either in or you're out, I, now which it, means you either keep your property or you lose your property. It, no, it depends on, um, you know, there's 
the county does the tax side of it, so I, I don't know it nearly as well as they do. But there are programs out there which put freezes on certain properties of disabled, elderly, things like that, so that the value that you're being taxed on doesn't go up over the years until you sell your house, I believe. Right. And you also so. have machinery for 65 or, year, 65 or older in your assessment possibly, uh, evaluation. Is that correct? Yeah. On a and I'm not, not saying we couldn't have something like this or right. another program, but just saying. Because I, that's, what, that's, where I, that's where I'm going is, you know, for, is there has to be a set of machinery for that assess, that uh, evaluates situation. I mean, we're playing situational football here. You know, it's just uh, to come up with a cookie cutter is a difficult thing. Yeah. And so that's why it's important to make sure these numbers get out there for everybody to understand what numbers you're exactly. kind of starting from. The reason I brought that up, Albert, yeah. is I was actually reading, you had sent me um, the meeting minutes from the Old Orchard Heights annexation from 1978. Um, and in there, it specifically states, in addition, provision ought to be made to ease what might otherwise be an unbearable tax burden for large acreages within the orchard. So back in 1978, it was already a concern then. Was anything done back then? Do they have tax freezes in place? I'm unaware of any out there right now, um, and especially since since the 39 years have passed, there's probably a very limited number of residents that are still out there that were there when that first got brought in, I would venture to guess. But it was, okay, but, yeah, my point is it was a concern then. I think it should be a definite concern now going forward that, you know. I, yeah, I'm not gonna disagree with you there at all. It's, Okay, Albert, thank you very much. All right, we're at the uh, task force member discussion, and one of the things we do need to discuss is, is our future meeting schedule, um, which was really at the top of the list, so we're gonna come back and recapture that now. Uh, and I believe uh, either Albert or Director Cooper can address this, but um, I think the request due to scheduling uh, within the planning department that uh, our next meeting be actually uh, Wednesday, May 17th. Is, is, and uh, Albert, correct me if I'm wrong here. And then the meeting after that could be either Thursday, June 8th. Um, again, that's because of um, uh, individuals within staff uh, not being available. Or Wednesday, June 14th which would put it off yet another week. Um, so let's, let's look at uh, May 17th. Does that schedule work with? I, I will be in St. Paul on May 17th and 18th. 17th and 18th, and obviously the Tuesday, we can't do it on a Tuesday uh, because city council's in here. Um, the Monday before, but you're gone on, you would be gone that Thursday also, the yeah, 8th or 9th. Yeah, I'm driving so back how about, Thursday. How about uh, that Wednesday, June 14th, there are other alternate date. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the 17th you said is is the conflict? Well, this, the 17th is, is when I, I, I go up there that morning and I, I'm coming back the next day on Thursday, so I'm, I can maybe make it back in time, but. So Thursday the 18th yeah, is I a possibility? Yeah, the 18th is a possibility. 17th how, is how does that look for other members? Thurs, so that would be Thursday, May 18th. Uh, Councilor Neitzer just pointed out another conflict, but I would be willing to uh, forego that for this. Purpose. Another evening, uh, another 5.30? Um, yes, we'd be looking at another 5.30. And um, uh, also, venue. I, per I personally like the Carnegie because of the ability to have us mic'd up. Um, also, for the ability to record this, too, and to broadcast it. So if you are unable to attend here uh, in person, you can watch it on TV or uh, web streamed as, uh, as well too. Uh, plus it'll be, you can go to the website and play the recorded version too. So are we, 
a consensus Goodwood on Carnegie, Thursday, yes. the May May 18th. Okay, so May 18th, same time, same location, the 5:30, and obviously the 7 o'clock. We're beyond that time already. Um, Let's, let's take a look at the next meeting, then. How about that June 8th or Wednesday? Uh, let's see, that's Thursday, June 8th, or Wednesday, uh, June 14th. Any preference? Wednesday would when be mine. Wednesday better? Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in Orlando on the 8th. <laughs> okay. So. You have to stop traveling. Yeah, apparently. Is, uh, so Wednesday, June 14th, okay on this end? So... Wednesday, June 14th, and then the other dates, Wednesday, June 28th, or Thursday, June 29th. Now, uh, Albert, that's only a two-week gap. Is that sufficient amount of time, or would you rather push that back one, one, one more week? If possible, we'd prefer a three-week gap to a make sure we get gap. information to everybody. Let me um, pull my calendar back up here. So that would be instead of uh, the 28th of June, we were looking at uh, July 5th, which <laughs> there's, a, there's also a planning commission going on. Uh, Thursday, the 6th of July. Does that, does that sound okay? All right, so if I understand, let me go through this again, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So we're looking at Thursday, May 18th, Wednesday, June 14th, and Thursday, July 6th. And all meetings scheduled 5.30 to 7 or whatever time we stop. Uh, and my other question then, tonight we tackled just two topics where the first meeting I think we had actually four. Uh, the next topic that is or topic scheduled to be presented June 7th and 8th uh, uh, or I mean our topic 7 and 8. Topic 7 is the impact on property owners in the community uh, if engineering design standards are lowered in an effort to get unannexed un property <laughs> annexed. And then topic eight is the impact on development if limitations are imposed on property owners wanting to annex land, but a pocket of unannexed property is created by that annexation. And examples will be provided. Uh, are we biting off a pretty big uh, chunk of the apple there that's going to cause us to go over time? Um, <clears throat> it's possible between the design standards and ADA stuff, the discussion could be pretty could get lengthier than maybe even I thought tonight was going to get. Well, that might be something that I would suggest you look, look into, possibly limiting it to one topic instead of two, which would mean that we, as we've discussed all along, we may have to add yet uh, uh, another meeting uh, beyond July 6th. But I'm, I'm committed to taking as much time as we need to do this right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for direction. I'm totally for being deliberative and taking this slow. Absolutely. All right. So, Albert, why don't uh, you and Director Cooper and others kind of look into that, what you think? Because we also, we don't want to get the meetings to be too lengthy as well, too, that it becomes a burden uh, on, on the public as, as well as members. At some point yeah. in time, are, uh, how are you, what's your intention on how we're going to present recommendations that we all agree or disagree on or a collection of those recommendations well really that final meeting well what's what on the original schedule thursday july 6th was that would be the intention of bringing final recommendations forward at that point and are you going to address those on an individual basis with each of the members or how are you going to do that that'll be a discussion between the members here okay okay Okay, so that sets the schedule. Any other topics? Because we will have public input. Uh, if, with the permission of, with the task force, I would uh, venture that we should extend our time, even though we're already nine minutes beyond our seven o'clock. Okay. Um, any other discussion from task force members? 
Okay, so that completes that. That brings us now to the public input. And I would just ask that members that wish to um, address the task force, or you can ask questions of, of uh, Mr. Danny Brown or Albert Schmidt as well, too, that you would step forward, uh, state your name, where you're from, and speak into the microphones. And the microphones are adjustable, so you can adjust them down or up as needed. Individuals that might be in the overflow room, you would be welcome to come forward as well. So again, name, state your name and where you're from, and then fire away. Welcome. Thank you. Joe Batchelor, I'm a resident of Sioux Falls, and uh, I'm a, a curious guy. I'm not always the smartest guy, but I uh, do a little bit of research on uh, annexations and what the cost-benefit analysis is, and I came across an article of a cost-benefit analysis that was done in Memphis, and obviously different city, different mill levies, different property values, but they found that it was um, had negative financial implications for the city, and what they did is they were looking at a 30-year uh, longitudinal um, cost-benefit analysis, 30 years because that's the life of what a road typically is. And they used accrual-based accounting because, let's face it, those maintenance costs, those are a liability and they need to be uh, accounted for. Um, and so I just think it would be interesting to see what kind of cost-benefit analysis there would be for a couple of the uh, areas around uh, Sioux Falls that we're looking to annex. Um, I think that it's a First and foremost, the city needs to decide if it's a good business decision to, to uh, annex this land. We've got a few hundred people here tonight probably, and they're probably concerned that it's gonna have a negative financial implication for them. I think we just need to make sure that it makes financial sense for everyone. So I would just ask um, before the task force concludes that a cost benefit analysis is done looking at the long-term maintenance, repair, and replacement uh, obligations that go into the infrastructure that the city will assume responsibility for, that that cost-benefit analysis is, is done so that we can make a sound financial decision. Um, you know, I, I wanna make sure that we're making a good financial decision for future generations, and as a, as a father of two young boys, I, I wanna make sure that, uh, you know, we're adding value to the city of Sioux Falls, so thank you. Joe, thank you for your comments. Okay, sir, step forward. I'm Mike Kokenj. I'm a resident, a proud resident of Mapleton Township. And I'd like, I, I don't know if it's been covered yet. It may have been covered a little bit tonight and a little bit the last meeting I was at. But I was wondering, what are all the ways we can protest a forced annexation? There I must think, be more than one way. Okay, good question. I think that was addressed a little bit, and, and Danny, would you like to uh, address that again? Well, the best course of action to protest uh, annexation is to come to the city council meetings, tell the city council you don't want to be annexed and why. Um, the council has to go through the determination of whether or not uh, the annexation uh, meets the requirements based on the study for the city initiated. Uh, if the council makes a determination that you're not agreeable with, then you have to, um, by referendum, submit that to a vote. Uh, if you don't do it that way, you can somehow challenge it to the circuit court if that's what you're seeking. You can file a petition and ask the city council to reconsider your property being annexed. Uh, the city would take that upon, uh, that's, that could come for the city council again. If the city council determined uh, by two-thirds vote, uh, well, if the city council determined that the, that the annexation go forward, they could do that. So, so okay. yes, can I just, so to clarify, I, I think there's, you said that there would be three, assuming that the city council passes, uh, annexes, the first would be to put the resolution um, on the ballot, which would be much like what happened with like Walmart and Shape Places, where they would have to collect 5% of the registered voters in the city plus who was annexed within 20 days after publication. So in 25 days, they'd have to get six or 7,000 signatures. Is that fair to say? To put it right. on the ballot? Right. I mean, that's number one. And then number two, um, they could 
um, try to petition to have us vote on it again. That would be a protest to take it to take them back out of the city. And then that would be a majority vote by us where we would vote to take them out of the city. That would be number two, correct? Right. And then the third would be some unknown legal challenge in circuit court. Right, so that, some constitutional challenge, correct. Those are the three, basically. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we go too much further, because I don't want to have other people leave, I have received a, a message from City Clerk uh, Tom Greco that uh, the city planning meeting was moved from their normal Wednesday of July 5th to Thursday, July 6th, for the same reason we didn't want to meet on July 5th. So I would, I would suggest that we just look at that next Wednesday, July 12th, in place of that um, July 6th. Is that acceptable? I wouldn't be out of town on the 12th. The 12th? Uh, is there another? How about the 13th? Well, the 11th would work. The 11th won't work for the city. Yeah, that's a Tuesday. Well, I'm gone the 12th, 13th, I said before I would offer to skip my city council meeting, too, and these guys probably would. But go ahead. The, the 13th? 12th and 13th don't work. Mm. Okay. Any other suggestions? How about uh, how about Monday the tenth? Everybody likes m Monday meetings. Mon Monday the tenth works for everybody. Fine. Okay, good. That's I think that's a much better alternative than pushing them back yet another another week. So that'll be Monday, July tenth. So once again, it's Thursday, May eighteenth, uh, Wednesday, June fourteenth, and then uh, Monday. July 10th, and I wanted to make sure I mentioned that before we lost anybody else uh, here this evening. Is there anybody else that has a comment uh, that would uh, they'd like to make? Sir, in the back. Okay, I had a couple of questions. Um, I know we're not supposed to talk about personal lots and personal developments. My name is Paul from Skyline Heights Edition. What I'd like to talk about is a corner lot and also um, a development that already has a lot of inf infrastructure. I personally am an acre. If it is a corner lot, the way I'm understanding this, I'll be assessed both sides. It's not a square lot, it's kind of like a boulder. That puts me at 490 feet, at 226 feet, $226 per foot. That puts me at $110, I'm sorry, $110,740. On a property that's tax assessed at $178,000. Is this, I guess this is more of a question, I have another question or, or comment to is that ratio something that is abnormal do you understand what I'm saying on that Albert I'll ask you to address that and because I, I do believe earlier you had stated that at least for frontage purposes it would be just one side yeah so when you do both it, the, the slide I had up there was based on the assessment the um, fee the street maintenance fee where you only do one side typically when we've done these talks in the past again that's the past but in the past, when we've talked about areas, um, the city has looked at participating on corner lots for the um, one of the corner, one of the two sides. I believe it depended upon where your access was. So typically, I think we looked at trying to not spread that over the whole development like a private development would, but rather just kind of play the bank there and just participate greater in that neighborhood by taking out those corner lots and participating on the one side. Okay. Another part on this is um, for my property, actually for all of the properties in Scanlon Heights Edition, we are paved on all sides. We have our own water distribution and we pay for Sioux Falls City water. So if we're not going to be 
paving and if the water infrastructure is already there, does that 226, sorry, does that 226 per square foot come down dramatically or is there a possibility for that? Albert? As far as I'm aware, again, in the planning office, not in the public works office here, but um, typically in the past how they've done things is if you have a certain uh, improvement already on the street before it's annexed in, uh, they won't assess for that same level of improvement back. So if you had pavement before and you're gonna have pavement after, you wouldn't, assuming that the thickness of the pavement, the width of the pavement was all the same, you wouldn't be assessed for that pavement. You might, again, if it was a little, need to become a little wider, something like that, maybe that overages would be charged back, but not the whole cost. I believe that's how they've done it in the past. Um, the thing to think of here is, you know, depending on the water lines, if the water lines are currently, if it's gonna be a public road versus a private road, that's the first comment question in there. Um, the second one is if it's city water and it's eight inch main minimum, which is needed for fire protection, so you don't, when you start fighting fires with a fire hydrant, you don't make the lines compress and <laughs> close in on themselves. Um, making sure you can, you know, have the fire hydrants out there. Um, so that might be one thing out there. Um, okay. If there's curb and gutter out there now, if there, or if there would be after the fact, I don't know what we would do, but. So the bottom um, line is that 226, negotiable might not be the correct word, but if there's infrastructure there, there's a possibility that 226 could come down and perhaps come down yeah, dramatically. Yeah, your 226 is probably your, your, the most expensive that we envision on a citywide look at it. But if you have specific improvements already, you're probably looking at a lesser amount than that. Okay. I would like to point out that that 226 is not necessarily set in stone. I mean, that's one of the purposes of the task force here is to help to make some of these determinations. Okay. And then my last thing, sir, is um, the concept of interest on assessments. So if I'm going to be, quote, borrowing $110,740 maximum from the city, for those improvements. I would assume in that 226, the cost of finance has already come into play so that the city does not need to add a finance charge. In other words, if you're gonna sell bonds, whatever that number 226 ends up to be, that, that amount would already be, in, would be considered in that amount. Therefore, if I do this $110,000, dollars over 20 years, my understanding is that's a 5% interest. You're making a 5% interest on my $110,000. I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's the way that I interpreted that. Okay, and again, sir, was your calculation based on both sides of your property or a single side? It was uh, on two sides. Okay, and as Albert had discussed, it, it would be assessed as one side but Danny or Albert, could you uh, ask, uh, answer his question? It deals with the interest. Or is that something that you would prefer to research and then get back to us at our next meeting? It's a pretty... I can, I can give it a shot. Okay, thank you, Danny. The, the state law says the city will set the interest rate, so by statute the city is authorized to set an interest rate on any assessment that we do. Whether there's a minimum that's required, I'm not aware of it, but not being a tax lawyer, I defer to finance. Uh, I don't know if there's some type of requirement because it basically is uh, a benefit to the property that the city is paying on that person's behalf or that property's behalf that there's some federal requirement that interest be attached to it. So it's not a gift, but a loan. So I don't know about that part. I don't think there is, but I defer to finance. The state law says that we set the interest rate. That's not his question. His question is, we all is, the, is, the, is the cost of borrowing the money in the 222 to $126 a foot? And if it is, why is he paying interest on the assessment? Yeah, That's his question. Am I right, sir? And, Thank you. And I believe the 226 is an engineering number based on our um, estimates, that are, our bids that we've gotten back from other ones as well, so that shouldn't include it. Like if we were going to build a street, we envisioned it would cost us $226 to build that street for, for foot including the cost of the bond, the financing. We typically don't bond streets. Where's the money come from? We typically pay for it out of our either um, the fees that we collect tax. through our platting fees, our sales taxes, our CIP budgets. Sales tax, 
So I don't think that, these yeah. percentages would be include that number, no. But you don't know whether it was bonded or not. Typically it's not, but it could be. Uh, it's an a great entire, question In other words, finance. if you were. It is not bonded. Okay. We for don't bond street towards. construction. Thank you, sir. I respectfully thank you very much for your time. You bet, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Staley, City Council. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is, I know that after this, the last meeting, a mailing was sent out to the people who signed up. Is that correct? Yes. So are you going to be mailing out uh, and continue to mail these people? Will these are, people be notified? Can you repeat by, your question, please? Uh, will the mailings be sent out for the next task force meeting as well? Yes, I, I would assume that that is, is the case, Albert. I think well, that would be appropriate. Okay, so how do these people make sure they're on a mailing list? Is By it, signing they, up the sheet that I had requested at the beginning of the meeting. Make sure you're signed up. Okay, then the next thing, and I know other council members, we have talked about that 5% that interest rate that there is a possibility in the negotiational part. We would take that off since the city gets 1.5% on money they borrow for projects. Also, I wanted to say if, if indeed people have to do a petition drive, that is a huge amount of work gathering thousands of signatures to because of an area that you're trying to not be annexed into for the, to go up against that. I would include, really encourage people to be involved now because once this comes to the city council, I do personally believe it might be too late to make changes. That's just my opinion. And I also want you to address this issue of pre-annexation, because as I've been visiting with people, there seems to be confusion about what, what you're binded, what's binding to you once you've said, we want to go into pre-annexation discussions. Let's say it doesn't work out. You don't like where it's going. Can you pull out of that, Albert? You know, are you, are you, because I think what people really want, as I've been talking to people, is they want flexibility, they want to be respected, but they don't want to be put out of their homes. And they want to be treated the same way as Old Orchard Heights, Norton Froelich area, uh, La Mesa Drive, over there by Walmart. We've we got all these areas that have been allowed to maintain their streets, their um, lack of sidewalks, the infrastructure that they have in place, their septic tanks. I think we need to show great respect to these people. So I guess the pre-annexation thing, I would like that. Maybe Danny, you could address that. And Councillor Staley, I'll, I'll repeat the. <laughs> the purpose of this task force is to try to come up with that fair and equitable process. And that's what we are convened here to do. And again, I will also tell you that this is an advisory committee only, that uh, it will go forward to the city council and then the city council will have further discussion on it. And at that time, there would be further public input as well too. Okay, Danny, thank you. Uh, as best I can, a pre-annexation agreement is a contractual arrangement. So if you're working with the city on a pre-annexation agreement, that in and of itself is flexibility because until you sign the document, you don't have an agreement to which you can be bound to. Uh, determining or depending on what type of pre-annexation pre agreement you signed and the terms in it will determine what the um, relief to the city would be if you didn't follow through with your pre-annexation or follow through with your annexation at a later date. The purpose behind the pre-annexation is to be flexible, is to allow people an opportunity to meet with the city to plan for the annexation on a timeline that's good for them and good for the city. So I would say, if you want flexibility, don't sign a pre-annexation agreement. If you uh, agree to the terms and the terms seem flexible to you and you like them, sign the pre-annexation agreement. Okay, thank you, Danny. And s s sir, and I think, were, were you the other individual? If we could go maybe three or four more people, because uh, we are approaching 30 minutes over schedule. And then I would also remind you that uh, what Albert had showed you in the beginning of the meeting, that you can uh, uh, submit questions uh, as well, too. So, sir, if you're ready, why don't you step up to the podium? Uh, Greg Johnson, uh, resident of Split Rock Township. Um, one thing I would just want to make sure the panel is aware of 
is that it's our understanding, and, and it might need to be confirmed, but as we exit our current rural water uh, provider that will be charged an additional amount of money uh, to pay off the uh, loans that that rural water district have. So just, I wanna make sure that's a, an additional cost that the panel is fully aware of, that uh, as we get annexed or if it were to go ahead, we'd be paying that additional cost. And then I'm also curious about the, uh, the rough number of the $226 per linear foot. Uh, you said that wasn't a comprehensive list. Uh, I'm curious if that list would include, at one time we were told that uh, as the line, we would pay an additional fee for our neighborhood to reach a main, the main trunk line in addition to the facilities in front of our street. So if we're a half a mile from the current city sewer, uh, do we pay for that additional cost, number one? And then two, uh, does that include the line from our current, as we leave our septic tanks, the line that goes then from our septic tank to the connection out in front of the street. And number three, then if the terrain doesn't allow for, for example, if our homes are a significant amount in elevation below the street, uh, the whole design might change. We might have a water line out front but a sewer line out back, how I assume that would increase the cost. And do we have any idea how much that would increase? Sure. Um, I can start you off with uh, some answers on some of those. Um, so I'm gonna work my way backwards on you. Um, so when you look at the cost that we have estimated in there, um, the 226 is a rough estimate cost for kind of an average what can happen out there. So when you start getting into the real details of actually designing it, that's where you really get a better idea of what the cost would actually be. And definitely um, elevations are gonna be a huge part in the especially the sewer side of the costs. So sometimes um, if you have a house that's lower than the road, obviously your sewer has to be able to flow and gravity flow into the city's current system. So there's elevations there that are in play and how low that sewer can really go depending where you're at. And so if the house is lower than that, you can't have a gravity system that feeds in higher at that point, otherwise you're gonna have issues. Um, so you know, if you have a house that's lower, that might actually be cheaper to go through the rear yards rather than in the street because of how deep that street would have to be and how far you'd have to cut it out. So that might actually be a cost benefit. You know, it would really depend. You have to really do analysis on it. But you might actually get a benefit cheaper wise to do that rather than in the street or the street might be cheaper depending on what the situation is. Um, the costs do not include the cost of connecting and removing your septic system to the sewer main for the, 220, for the 226. That's just the street sewer, the main itself. Um, those costs would vary, could vary greatly, um, you know, depending on what grade, if you have to remove trees, you have to remove concrete, that kind of stuff. Um, typically, we estimate right now, if you're going to remove your septic system, that's about $5,000 for our estimate. Uh, again, that, there's, I've heard different numbers out there for what reality could actually be. But that's and Albert, if I right. could also interject that, at the last meeting, there was some discussion about if you had a perfectly fine operating septic system, for, for instance, you just replaced it, there was a discussion that there wouldn't be a requirement to replace that until it was actually in need. And then you would hook up to sewer at that point in time. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we don't have that um, cost for that line to the private side include theirs because the timing of that isn't exactly known because it could depend greatly if there's agreement in place to allow that septic system to remain for the rest of its life in there. Right. And then basically the cost, uh, the cost of going from our neighborhood to a main line, I mean, that's an unknown, but could that be substantial? Typically when we're doing these projects, we already have a sewer main um, abutting the area or a plan in there. So typically that cost to connect would, would be the road area in there already. So if you have a substantial um, line connection to make, I don't know the answer to that one off the top. I don't believe that's included 226, but. Um, okay. 
Typically, uh, there's already one on a budding street, so that that street construction fee should be pretty accurate. Well, and if there's nothing, you know, if it's a half a mile away, it could be significant. Am I am I correct or not? Well, if it's a half mile, we're putting a trunk line in. You, you potentially have the opportunity there, and it could probably vary on a situational basis. But you probably have, you potentially could be working looking at CIP budget rather than that, waiting for that to come through for so the sewer line gets put in, and then your guys' sewer line would be put in, and the assessment obviously wouldn't come through for the CIP stuff, but rather your locally streets. So and Albert, would it also be safe to say if it was that far away that we most likely wouldn't be looking at an annexation at that point in time? It would ultimately depend on the State Council's recommendation, but I believe it would right. be safe to look at that you look at what, what's reasonable, and right now, 200 feet to the property line is when we make it connect, or when we get that notice for five years, typically. Um, and so if it's farther away, we typically don't like to make people right. put that Thank in. you. And ma'am, come forward, please. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Josie Alpers. I'm a member of the Split Rock subdivision, and I was unable to make the previous meeting. I was out of town. Um, I did want to make sure that everyone understood what the first gentleman from Sioux Falls stated about the cost of annexation in the long term costing the city more than they get back in taxes is uh, researchable um, information. Uh, the other fact is that I don't know of a single person that I have spoken with that actually wants to be annexed. I think that's the unstated thing um, in the room. Even if all the streets and lights and curb and gutter and sidewalk and sewer were handed us for nothing, we would prefer to live in our homes, in our community, in the way it is now. Um, our septic systems work. <laughs> our, se our septic systems work. Our water is excellent in quality. We've had it personally tested. Our um, snow removal is excellent. We live on a very steep hill, which is a problem because we see we go into Sioux Falls and we see that the, um, the streets are not cleaned. But our street is cleaned all the way out to Highway 11 and we can get into work and it becomes an emergency situation when it's not cleaned, um, just based on the fact of how um, narrow and how steep the hill is. Um, the other thing is just that we talk about special benefits and I would like to state that if I sold my house after annexation, again, even for free, the special benefits would be less than what it is now. Once again, it perceived benefits of living in a nice, quiet, rural community are significant. And I would really ask the city to find out if they want more in taxes. Maybe we could give them something in taxes. Or if, I mean, seriously, if we're going to be paying 26% more in taxes, why don't we just give you 26% more in taxes and call it good? Okay. Because we don't, I mean, I'm just saying that, that we May want I to. May I remind you again, this isn't about an annexation of your subdivision or any other subdivision right now, but it's an exploration of the process and how to approach this in a fair and equitable way. And your, your comments are very much appreciated. They're, they're specific to our subdivision, but I think they are um, representative of a lot of the more rural subdivisions where we each have an acre. That's why we have um, septic, and we don't want to have sewer. We'd rather just keep our septic. It's working great, and it costs us next to nothing. And so I, I would just wanted to point that out that, I mean, I think that the city really, I would appreciate if they really took into consideration the length and the depth and how far these roads are in between the houses and how much it costs versus how much in taxes they're going to receive over the long run, because I don't know if it's in the best interest. And then I also had a question about if we don't have the curb and gutter, which we don't want, this, the sidewalks, that kind of thing, then what about the sewer? I think that was partially answered, is that we don't, there wasn't any cost listed about what additional annex, what would be annexed for sewer. And so I think in the future, I'd like to know if that's broken out to rural road and then sewer, then we would know how much the total cost would be. And I had one other request, sorry, um, is that I've seen the condition of the roads in Old Orchard, not recently, but been through there, and they are extremely bad. We have been paying for our roads, and they are fine the way they are now. If we pay the added costs to Sioux Falls, is there a commitment to actually maintain our roads even at our current standards? Albert? 
or Danny? I mean, we'll be paying the added taxes. I just want an assurance from the city that they're actually going to maintain our roads. Okay. Well, it would ultimately depend on if those are going to be public roads or private roads, first and foremost. Uh, for the private road, there is no city maintenance, and the development could continue to pay uh, the private snow removal service and get the same service they have now for the same value that they pay. Um, if it's a public road, then you do have the public services, um, and then have to talk to streets on that side of it. Thank you. Okay, one last comment, or one last uh, input. Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas Vay from Sioux Falls, and uh, I'm just kind of curious. We talked about you know two lane roads. Um, there's areas around town where there's going to be divided double lane roads. Um, how is that going to is is the dollar amount that those individuals going to have to pay more, at, you know, than the 226? Um, and also, as far as assessment goes, um, some of those areas are surrounded by commercial right up to their property line, already zoned commercial. Um, I know that we don't want to set a cookie cutter dollar amount for every property, but I heard that brought up that we need to keep things fair. I don't think so. If there's commercial development going in across from somebody's property, they should be assessed at a higher value and or dependent upon the development going in, maybe that development should have to pay more of the burden than a single homeowner. So, um, and then the other one, the guy, the, the gentleman uh, just a minute ago brought up the rural water payoff. That's, you know, that's something that needs to be brought up as well. How do we handle that? And what's the extra cost of that dependent upon where we're at in town? Sure. You know, Lincoln County, is that different than North Minnehaha or East Minnehaha, you know, something like that. So, um, so that's what I'm... Is the agreements with all the rural water the same, the amount of money? When you look at the rural water stuff, typically it's based on what loans they have available out there versus how many customers they have. So as they lose customers, that amount will change. Or if as they gain customers, that amount could change. So it's dividable, you know, it's the total loan amount divided by how many customers you have. That's your typically your buyout. Okay, and... Uh, and the choice of whether that burden is the taxpayers or the cities is it's not regulated by law, is it, or, or is it? It's not a. It's a choice. It's not a state of, law item. No. It's not a state law. So, customarily, when if I buy another person's truck line, um, I don't have to pay his fuel bill. So I'm kind of curious about how that, the logic behind that. But that's. It, and one more about the road, just quick. Um, for people who have a corner lot, a square lot, the, uh, the, the, the dollar amount then, you know, we're talking frontage, and I know we said only one side, but does that minus, uh, if it was only on one side, the 50-foot setback? So you're only measuring to my 50-foot setback or someone else's as opposed to all the way? Because right now we pay to the center of the road. You know, most of the time, um, private property lines go from, if you're in the city of Sioux Falls on their sidewalk, typically two feet back from the backside of the sidewalk. So most of the roads are on public property, so you don't pay to the center of the road on most of them. Um, and then the frontage will be based on the property line front footage, typically. And then to go back to just for you, uh, on the 226 is based on a local, a local road. Typically, that's just a two-lane road. When you start getting into where they put a median in and four lanes, typically that's going to be probably an arterial network street. So typically, then you're looking at the arterial street fee. So if you have an access onto that, you're typically not going to pay for construction of that street because that street is utilized more than just locally. It's probably more regionally or neighborhood-wise. So typically, those construction costs and those are taken in by the city. And if you have a, a access onto those roads, then you're going to pay the sidewalk assessment instead of the street assessment. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. And there was a gentleman here that I know that wanted to speak earlier, so please, well, well come on up. Well, frankly, Rick, I'd rather not be asking these questions, but it seems like no one else did, so I guess I'm going to have to. Uh, just like a lot, I believe a number of the different uh, communities you around had meetings. who you are, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm John Brown, Split Rock. We had a meeting just as uh, I believe a number of other communities have now had a had meetings internally trying to figure out what's going on. And we are in an information gathering mode just as you are. Uh, as was said earlier, I think we have a general perspective on things, but we are also trying to figure out what the pluses and minuses are about this whole thing. So the 
the one thing that has not been addressed at all, and we just skipped right through it, and I appreciate Albert and everybody else getting in the weeds here with uh, nuances of interest rates and so forth, but the fundamental question is why? Why are we going through this process at all? What is the urgency to evaluate this situation? What is the burr about the 62 communities? Uh, that has not been explained or elaborated. We did hear one page reference at the beginning of this whole process, but that was all for the convenience of the city, why this implications and so forth. And it had nothing to do with the citizens who don't currently have a voice in any of that, and that's everybody out here. Um, so, so we would like to know why and what are the alternatives. I personally know of a, of a large number of cities across the country that have communities well within city and county limits. Uh, as an example, Pittsburgh has 130 communities within a county that is just a little bit smaller than Minnehaha. 130 individual, separately governing, separately controlled cities, and somehow they seem to get along with each other. So I, the question is why, and, and you can't answer that now. It would be great if you could, that would be wonderful. The second uh, question is, uh, it's really two parts. One, purported benefits. We keep hearing about some benefits. That would be helpful to know. What are these benefits? We've had discussions and we're, we're coming up a little short. Um, the other thing is we've had uh, allusions to benefits that are currently uh, available or utilized by uh, folks in these 62 communities that they're not paying for now. Uh, we'd love to know what that list is also because um, most people we've talked to are paying for fire, uh, are paying for water, are paying for uh, you know their utilities. Uh, they have are paying for the sheriff and so on. So we just don't know what those are as well. So that might be helpful uh, to elaborate a little bit on that piece. Um, two more things. Apologize, uh, but people had a pretty good list, as you might imagine. Um, how many representatives are on this? task force from areas that could possibly be annexed? That, I think, is a question you might be able to ask. I know one, two, three. Okay. And you're not in Sioux Falls currently? Okay. Okay. Appreciate that. There was uh, some concern that there was either underrepresentation or not complete representation, and I know there can't be complete representation, but there seem to be some fairly sizable areas that are not represented. So there was a request that was fairly uh, broad-based to expand the number of people on the task force by at least a couple people. So that's one thing, consider that if you would. Um, finally, uh, the mayor has had a couple of uh, uh, conversations with uh, media about this, and there was some encouraging words from the mayor um, this past uh, uh, interview, I guess, where he, and I recognize the, um, the nature of divided government, um, but uh, he seemed to take roads, gutter, curb, and lights off the table. Um, you, Rick, have said, and I know you're referencing the prior session, that if individuals have operating systems such as sewer systems, that it makes no sense perhaps to even consider replacing those or putting in you know, sewer lines and so forth. It might help to diffuse some of the situation, as you can imagine. Uh, you see the crowd. There's a lot of angst out here. Uh, it might help to diffuse the situation to actually lay some of those things out as perhaps not being part of the picture. Um, if a community does not want it, why do they have to be forced to have it? And that would perhaps help clear the air a bit. So just, uh, just some things that people were raising and thought you might be interested in hearing. Okay, so. John, thank you very much. <laughs> the, um, the why, again, goes back to why there was this task force formed and, and uh, counselors can address this as well. 
but uh, we're here tonight because of what Mr. Metzger had experienced with the annexation of his property. And that was the, the one that the council said, let's step back and let's take a look at this process. Is there a better way that we can come up and be consistent with it as well? And, and other councilors, if you want to chime in, or if Matt, if you want to yourself. I, I, I just felt through the whole thing that the communication had broken down and I just, it, it, we needed to have the discussion about under what circumstances would we annex, would we ever forcibly annex, if so under what conditions and um, just try to improve the process. And I've come in again completely open-minded with no preconceived notion of where this is going, but that's kind of where it came from. There was just some unease about the way in which that situation went and we wanted to see if we could improve it. Correct. Yeah, I would agree with pretty much. I can't say it any better than that. It's just we want okay. to thank Mr. you Mr. Brown, system. is he still here? Yes. I understood that your question was why is there such a burning need to annex these 62 areas? That, that's more the question. Not why is the task force here? Okay. What, what's the city's burning need to well and, and again I, I wouldn't say there is a burning need there as I stated earlier there is not a grand plan to annex the 58 to 62 subdivisions within any time frame whatsoever certainly not within this next year or or who knows there isn't a time frame on that but uh, Albert if you or or Councillor Knights are I think uh, from a planning department perspective, what we were looking at overall was to try to get a basis of where the criteria really are from an elected officials' perspective on what the, where the support is, what we want to look at long term. Because a lot of times when we were going into neighborhoods, um, it might have been too late. So ideally, we want to get out there ahead of time, start talking to people, give us time to talk with people about um, you know, what kind of improvements we're looking at, what's the future going to hold. Um, so ideally for us, this is about identifying the criteria first and foremost so that we can then lay out and give people estimates on timelines of when things are happening. Because right now it's, it's tough to go into a neighbor and go, well, we're going to talk to you, but not you. Why? So when we're looking at spending you know, CIP funds or when there's a project already out there, is there a way that we can you know, collaborate and save money if we're going to do infrastructure improvements because we're already out there? So those are kind of the base discussions we had, then you go, we'd like to get that criteria figured out so that long term we can figure out and we can start planning for, because in planning we like to make sure that people can depend on something and it's, con and it's consistent. We don't want to have sporadic policies this way and that way. So it's not that we want to look at all these areas and go, we need you in tomorrow, or by the end of the year we're going to get, that's not what we're looking for at all. It's more of a, based on, show me X, Y, and Z, all right, is that what we're looking for? Right, now we need to at least start talking to neighborhoods based on this, these kind of criteria. So that's really the goal of it. Not so much, our goal wasn't to try to get everybody up in an uproar and get everybody in at once, um, but just try to, you know, so that people can plan on either retiring or buying houses. Because um, the biggest issue that we run into with property owners and these annexation talks is uncertainty. People go, you just killed my home value because now people are worried that we're gonna annex in and they don't know what the amount's gonna be. Um, and our goal is let's create that, you know, we want to give certainty and timeline, help create a definitive timeline here of when we're going to start discussions with neighborhoods so people can have an idea. So um, would it be helpful to you if the council decided that annexation was off the table and they were going to forget the 62 and move on? Any policies that the council decides helps us out definitively with um, where we want to go. So if the council decides that there's these criteria to meet or there's you know, we're just not doing them. Um, either way, it helps from a planning perspective us to identify what, what the future will hold for those areas. Was that? Yes. I, I would no just say, answer. thank you. I, I would just say I'm an elected official. I only speak for myself. I'm not part of the administration. Coming into this and still where I'm, I'm still struggling and I don't know where I'm gonna go with this is, um, you know, I've asked myself, is this a problem? I don't know if it is or not, and what is the need? I, do, I don't know, to be completely honest with you. And, and those are questions that we need to answer, because to the extent that it is a problem, or if it isn't, 
that's going to help guide us in the right direction and the same with the need. So I, I can't really answer those questions because I'm, I'm not in the administration with all respect. Mm -hmm. So. And I would also add that uh, there's such a variation between subdivisions too and in, in uh, each has their own unique characteristics and quite frankly I've got I have friends that live in some of these subdivisions and I've told them I I envy what you have so don't p please don't assume that we're automatically going to make a decision one way or the other here uh, we are trying to approach this the best that we can uh, with an open mind so that as we do proceed that we do it fairly and that we can try to provide the planning department with that kind of direction that they're looking for as well. Well, we are almost an, an hour past, but again, if you did not get an opportunity to speak, I would encourage you to go online and submit your questions or, or comments. And I do thank you for being here this evening. And a reminder, our next meeting is Thursday, May 18th. Thank you, task force members, for taking time out of your personal schedules. And thank you, citizens, for coming, too. Thank you very much.